Um, so the uh, the chapters eight through eleven are on on steel buildings, and uh, we're going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, probably not as many examples on steel buildings for retrofit as you you'll find in the concrete buildings or the um, masonry buildings, certainly, or even the wood frame. Um, so. Typically, they're going to be on maybe larger structures, um, and probably not as many uh, examples that we can uh, we can point to. Um, but we do have so we, what I think are some good information for you if if you do have a steel building that you need to look at as far as retrofit. Um, as far as the building types, uh, similar to the other chapters, uh, the primary ones that we're going to be talking about today are the steel moment frame buildings, as well as the brace frame buildings. Um, you can see the typical. Uh, the configurations here, um, in this case, the uh, any kind of wall systems around elevators or stairs would be uh, non-lateral load resisting, uh, probably out of partition walls or the like. So maybe one of some of the more modern buildings. Uh, the other types, which we are not going to cover in detail, I, will, I do have one slide on each one, are uh, steel frame buildings with concrete shear walls, um, a, a type of construction that um, wasn't too widespread. Um, maybe in the 60s, there were a fair number of these sorts of buildings uh, where ed engineers took advantage of uh, perimeter walls or walls around the uh, uh, vertical shafts for concrete, in, used in concrete, and then a, a gravity steel frame uh, and primarily, maybe a moment frame as a backup system in a dual system. And then uh, this type of building, the one that we're in today, um, is a very sort of a classic original type of steel frame construction where you have a steel uh, Steel, complete gravity steel frame, uh, possibly with riveted connections uh, and or sort of bolted connections in some of the you know, newer buildings, but from the, the 20s, 10s, 1910s, 1920s, uh, with masonry infill around the entire perimeter of the building. Um, and generally, these buildings were originally designed for uh, wind loads uh, primarily, maybe you know, 1 to 2% G kind of numbers on the gravity connections. A uh, little bit of lateral connections in the in the, in the riveted wind frames, and then uh, a lot of the resistance though in the in the masonry systems. So we'll talk a little, just a little bit about that as well. And, come on. Okay, so uh, talk a little or go through the, the the deficiencies then on the moment frames. Um, primarily, these are going to be uh, generally they're going to be drift limited. Um, and potentially with frames, with frame strength, a lot of the earlier moment frames were designed prior to building codes having drift requirements. So if you look at them in, with today's standards, they're going to be not have enough stiffness, so uh, probably need to be uh, stiffened up in many cases. Uh, typical things about re-entering corners, soft stories that can be configuration things to, to, depending on the architectural design. Uh, sometimes load passer issues um, and, and the like, maybe local connection details at the foundations you can find. Um, and then we get into the, the typical things that uh, came out of the Northridge earthquake where we have uh, problems with connections uh, in uh, either column splices, beam the column connections, some of the classic things that came out of the Northridge earthquake and subsequent research. Um, and then a little bit on diaphragms, although in, for steel buildings, usually not one of the primary issues. So just to go through again the pre-Northridge uh, issue that came out of the earthquake in 94 uh, where we had the, <coughs> excuse me, the typical moment frame connection where the, uh, uh, we had welded flanges and bolted webs uh, with uh, probably not very good weld material in the complete joint penetration welds, maybe some issues with uh, procedures and processes to get good, good uh, performance, and we found a number of those buildings on the order of 100, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not sure I'm losing my voice, uh, 100 or more damaged in the earthquake uh, led to a large amount of research and testing that went on, sponsored by FEMA, uh, as well as private research that uh, went on to try and explore this problem and found a uh, lot of issues related to the, um, the connection itself and its a number of deficiencies there the type of materials that we were using as far as welding, et cetera. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of problems with this connection that then led to a lot of uh, additional uh, updating in our procedures now for new construction. And a number of these buildings have been retrofit as well. So some of the things that you can do, 
uh, for these and again to uh, hopefully try and protect these potentially um, damageable connections. Uh, you can add in the steel brace frame, a couple of examples here, uh, one being the sort of using a uh, sort of special concentric brace frame approach where uh, those of you that have designed these in new construction, similar idea if, if you want to go with a retrofit, adding in new gusset plate here, uh, trying to use that uh, capacity or the idea of a fold line for your uh, braces, putting in a brace here um, beyond using typical construction techniques that you might use for new construction uh, and just kind of adding it in for the, the existing building. Um, noting here that uh, issues that can occur, I lost my mouse again, um, issues that can occur at the uh, net section where we slot the tube to go over a gusset plated connection uh, and the idea that to reinforce that area so that you don't get a net section fracture which we found in some testing uh, at various universities. You may need to do some stiffening plates in various locations to transfer loads um, so it's really not unlike what we've done in, uh, uh, in new construction, probably a lot of times these will be on the moment frame lines so that you do have collectors and uh, things built in. And again, the idea here is to protect the, the moment frame connection from the drift levels that might lead to fracture. Um, another idea, similar idea here, uh, where instead of a special concentric brace frame, if you can get away with sort of ordinary detailing where you maybe have much more compact uh, gusset plates if you've got maybe lower demands, similar concepts, but uh, not trying to, to make the larger gusset plates that uh, can allow that fold line to go through. So uh, again, some of the issues with that, I talked about the different uh, detailing, whether you use the special concentric brace approach, frame approach or not. Uh, using gusset plates uh, can provide you some field tolerances, which are always good to have when you're working on um, existing buildings mentioned the idea of the issues with the reinforcing and cover plates when you're using uh, these uh, brace frame can, or uh, HSS braces. Uh, issues with welding, um, when you're working in an existing building, obviously if you're going to be welding, you have to have fire watch issues, um, getting fumes out of the building, especially if you're going to have people within the building working. Uh, either at the same time as the work's going on or you know, if it's overnight work the next morning. Uh, you've got issues with access. A lot of times these frames are on the perimeter of the building, so uh, getting in to do some of these uh, uh, welds are difficult, especially if you've got continuity plates or stiffener plates that you need to add on the outside of the frame line adjacent to the cladding. And I've, and I've got an example where I talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then issues with uh, you know, non-structural elements, asbestos removal, those sorts of things, and some of the older frames that you need to deal with. Another approach would be to uh, add strength and stiffness with the addition of a masonry or concrete shear wall. Uh, what we're showing here is a plan view of uh, putting a, a shear wall right on a, a frame line where you can see that the steel column becomes embedded within a new shear wall and then uh, becomes part of the, uh, the cord or the, the uh, overturning resistance of the new shear wall. Uh, some issues that you have to deal with here are getting the rebar through uh, and, and properly tied into the system so that it can act uh, compositely, if you will. Uh, you may have to do, you know, you're going to be doing drilling, etc., through the steel flanges in order to get some of this rebar through. So you have to come up with details that will allow you to place uh, those bars through there. We've got some, some notes about how you might do that, how you tie the, the, uh, the boundary elements, etc., to make that work. Um, so you can see it's kind of the idea of encasing the steel frame within these new, um, these new walls. Uh, and also, in some cases, if you've got coupling beams, you, you'll need to check the steel beam to, to verify that it can work as a coupling element, if that's the case. Um, as you look at other details, and <coughs> excuse me, we've, uh, we basically tried to give you all the, the typical details to, uh, to make that work throughout the system. Uh, this would be a section looking at, at uh, trying to carry the, the new shear wall from one floor to another through the existing beam and in this case uh, the, the detail doesn't show the concrete sort of encasing the beam but transferring the load through shear connectors and uh, potentially some stiffening plates uh, down so that you can make the, the you know, transfer the shear 
uh, across from one floor to another. So there's uh, discussions about how to, to open up the steel deck to do that uh, and provide ties in and trying to leave the existing rebar through for connect connectivity um, and some, some detailing issues that you have to worry about. In this case, trying to add in some additional shear capacity with a, a, the effectively a doubler plate in this area to, uh, to get the shear force down from one floor to another. Um, so it talks, you know, we've got some things about couplers and, and congestion and how to work through all that. So there's a lot of thought that uh, um, you have to go through to, to fully detail one of these things, and a lot of those uh, are, are keyed in in some of the, the uh, information in the document. Here's another piece of that, and again, the idea here is uh, if we're going to do one of these new concrete walls, and in this case the wall is sort of perpendicular, it's, or the, beam, the column is pass, the wall is passing by the column on either side, um, and in a shotcreted condition, or use, use the shotcrete here, there's some uh, uh, guidance on uh, how to do the, the starting and starting, stopping of the shotcrete piece versus a uh, poured in place piece, because uh, you won't be able to get on the back side of the, of the entire steel column in order to get the shotcrete in uh, all the way. So in this case, you, you need to combine the shotcrete with a poured in place pilaster, if you will, around the steel column. Uh, here's a, there's a couple details in on how to strengthen uh, base connections. And in this case, uh, in many, in many times, you know, we basically have a, a base plate with some anchor bolts. Uh, may not be able to develop full capacity of the, uh, of the shape in order to develop a plastic hinge or something approaching that at the base of the connection. There are a couple of simple details. First one, kind of a, a all steel approach, stiffening the, the base with some plates, maybe extending the base plate, adding some anchor bolts, um, and a lot of detailing issues about how, do you, how you might do that. Um, talks about how to transfer shear forces and again recognizing that uh, it's difficult to um, to expect anchor bolts or anchor rods, I should say, to uh, transfer all the shear forces, and that you may be looking at other approaches to try and uh, transfer the shear forces out and just rely on the anchor rods for for tension um, or overturning forces. Another approach here, um, if you've got the space uh, potentially in a basement area or an area that's not as critical to the architectural. Um, functions of the, of, the, of the building, you might be able to add a pedestal um, in concrete to deliver the overturning force or the, or the shear uh, through the concrete element down into the foundation. So not relying on steel plates and anchors and, and welds to do that. Um, again, you need to have the access to be able to get in and do this, but just another approach to strengthening the column base. Okay, now there's a, a couple of uh, connection details that are mentioned in the document on how to uh, upgrade or enhance a, a moment connection in uh, some fairly simple ways. These were basically taken from the AISC design guide. Uh, AISC sponsored some research after the Northridge earthquake along with uh, NIST on uh, looking at some retrofit details. There are a few different ideas that are, are presented in the document, and again, more of the detail is in the AISC design guide. Uh, the first one here is an approach where uh, it's sort of a combination of removing the existing weld material uh, from at the top flange here. Uh, we'd be removing the, the old weld material and replacing it with a new notch tough weld material, and at the bottom flange, um, providing a a reduced beam uh, section cut to sort of reduce the demands in this area um, as well as uh, re removing that, that weld material. So a few different ideas here. You may be also trying to uh, st uh, strengthen the shear connection with some welds there. Um, so there are some various ideas and options here. In addition, um, there's this welded haunch approach. Um, this approach was uh, I looked at down at UC San Diego and uh, worked fairly well in the sizes of the, of the members that they looked at. Um, the idea with the haunch is that you sort of uh, uh, short circuit the shear force in the connection uh, and it, as well as improving the, uh, the moment capacity at the face of the column and, and protecting the, uh, the demand on the existing welds. In the, but in this case, again, we're removing the, um, the non-ductile non weld material from the original connection and replacing it with uh, 
um, more, more tough weld material. Uh, and this, this uh, shear tab, I'm sorry, the haunch does uh, take some of the shear force out of the connection and, and thereby also helps to reduce the, the, um, um, the demand on the connection. One of the things that you have to be careful about are uh, weld toughness issues I mentioned. The, the detailing is very important here and uh, <clears throat> access again is important as well as uh, making sure that you get good quality control in the, uh, in the retrofit um, on site. There's a couple of uh, details for column splices that are shown. Um, again, one that's uh, related to a, more of a welded connection versus one that's on more of a bolted side. Um, the, one of the things on column splices that to be uh, really uh, careful about is many times these are partial penetration welds and uh, we know that those are potentially um, going to be non-ductile as well because of uh, uh, not having full or complete penetration. You get a notch that could lead to a, a, an early fracture. So in some cases here we're talking about adding plates to reinforce the area, uh, potentially removing again and, and replacing the weld with notch, notch tough weld or just adding some extra plates to reinforce the area so that uh, uh, we don't get a, uh, a stress concentration local here that could cause a weld fracture in the column splice. Uh, the bolted splices again probably don't develop the full capacity of the member in many cases and if that's a, a desire from your retrofit design uh, the idea here is to transfer what is probably a single shear type of bolted splice into a double shear, um, adding additional bolts and plates to, to make that happen. So you can go through uh, the design process in doing that. And again, issues are going to uh, be around being able to get access to drill the holes. Um, what do you do about keeping the, the uh, splice in place while you're adding new plates, etc.? So a lot of, of construction issues. Um, so again, on the design considerations on the welded side, you need to be worried about uh, kind of shrinkage strains that you might be uh, inducing due to large splices and tolerance on bolted splices, so I just uh, checked on there. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit on moment frames. Let's talk about brace frames. Um, again, in these cases, primarily you're going to be looking at, at strength issues uh, in most cases and potentially uh, components that are not as ductile as we'd like them to be, connect connection issues, etc. Um, a lot of the problems with brace frames are that uh, potentially the, the components themselves are not going to be able to go through the deformation levels that we, we hope to, uh, they, that they would be able to. And in the past, in the older uh, uh, versions of brace frame, concentric brace frames, the connections might not be strong enough to develop the capacities of the members and therefore we can get some connection issues. So a couple of ideas. Um, first is enhancing brace connections. Um, we, one of the things that we want to be careful about, and uh, this is something that we now have for new construction, is that we want to be careful about not sharing load between welds and bolts in the same line of force uh, because of the deformation compatibility issues. So if you are going to be augmenting a, a brace frame connection, you want to be careful about uh, how, you, how you go about doing that. And then uh, another thing is if you do have, for instance, you want to try and strengthen a connection plate or something like that with new weld material, uh, be very careful about mixing the weld material, just like placing new weld material over an existing weld. Say you've got a fillet weld that was uh, on the original construction and you want to make the fillet weld larger to de develop the capacity of the member. You need to be careful because there are times when even though your new material has toughness, the fact that the old material didn't have toughness, when those two material, the two welds mix during the, the new welding process, you may end up with a lower toughness weld than you were hoping for. So you have to be careful about that. Probably need to get some, um, some work done with your inspection folks to, uh, to look at that and then probably do um, some uh, in individual material testing to verify that you're going to get the kind of toughness that you want. Um, <clears throat> you may also be looking at redetailing gusset plates and the like in order to get the kind of response that we're looking at for uh, modern steel construction. Um, some more ideas on enhancing ductility and strength of braces themselves. Uh, I talked a little bit about some of the issues with HSS sections. 
Um, we may be in, in their potential for fracture, especially the older days where we had e, uh, high B over T ratios that we know after just a few cycles might start to crack and tear. Um, ideas there might be filling the, the, the tube with grout, the HSS section with grout to, uh, to help to eliminate or, or um, at least st stretch out uh, how many cycles it can go through before we get local buckling in the walls of the tube. Uh, again, the, uh, another idea might be to actually pull out, and I've got an example of that, this in, in one of the uh, slides coming up, a project where we actually pulled out conventional braces and replaced them with more ductile buckling restraint braces, and we're able to justify basically the rest of the system um, by, uh, with that primary approach. And I also mentioned another way on the HSS sections to look uh, out for that issue with the uh, um, area where you get the, the uh, net section problem at the the uh, uh, the, <coughs> the slot for the HSS sections. So just one slide on the um, deficiencies we might run into on the uh, concrete shear wall mo or steel frame building. And again, a lot of this one uh, is covered in the, because the concrete shear wall is a primary system, uh, a lot of this will be covered in the concrete shear wall section of the document. Uh, typical things might be wall strength if we've got some discontinuities, uh, things like that at the base of the building uh, where the load path wasn't properly put together. Um, and if you do are relying on the steel frame as a sort of backup moment frame, a lot of things we just talked about for the moment frame might come into play. Um, so it's, it's sort of a combination of looking at the concrete shear walls versus the steel moment frames. And on the older uh, steel frames with the brick infill, again, similar uh, issues are going to come up here. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of times these do have uh, discontinuous walls at the ground floor. They're very common to have a, sort of a storefront at the ground floor. Probably if you walked by this building, you'd see the restaurant on uh, Powell Street or the, you know, shops along here on uh, this storefront. So you're going to end up having the brick kind of uh, re uh, be reduced in capacity at the ground floor, may end up with a soft story. There are ways to approach that, maybe with some bracing or some uh, uh, new walls behind the uh, existing brick walls, those sorts of things. But again, similar in that uh, we'll be talking about that when Brett talks about masonry. Uh, so a lot of the, the retrofit techniques that you would use for a masonry wall building would be, uh, also be able to be used on this type of construction. So I'm going to talk about a few examples of projects uh, on steel frames and retrofits. Uh, the first example is um, for a large manufacturing facility. Um, and this in, in plan here, you can see uh, the, the graphic on the right. Uh, the building in plan is on the order of 400 feet by 250 feet long. And uh, the, the lateral systems are, are concentrated down at the end wings of the building and for both directions. So these buildings basically have a very long uh, unbraced diaphragm. And uh, there's, you know, when you calculate diaphragm deflections, that becomes a major issue. Um, because the owner of the building, and Bill mentioned some of these, these issues this morning, uh, was really trying to make sure that there was no disruption uh, to their operations. Uh, the idea was to go with buttresses on the outside of the building and then uh, providing collectors across the building to, uh, to tie the building together, thereby reducing the diaphragm span dramatically and providing additional shear capacity in the transverse direction. A uh, graphic on, on the uh, lower left here is the kind of the external buttresses that were designed into that structure. So a few, uh, a few sketches from the, the construction and uh, a couple slides from the construction you can see the, the buttresses coming up to the second floor and the roof, uh, coming down to a single point here, sort of a large foundation under, under that, and a pair of columns here that frame on either side of the building frame column. And I'll show you a detail of how that worked on the next slide. Uh, a couple of the details at the base here, we've got a sort of a pier under large foundation to support our new column adjacent to the building. One thing to note, and Brent, Brent will be talking about this in a little bit on the foundations part. Uh, we, we would potentially be undermining the uh, existing foundation column, so we needed to do some shoring here to make sure that uh, we didn't have any problems with the existing uh, foundation while the new construction was going on, and you know, sort of tying those in together in some cases as well. 
Um, here's a, a detail, a plan detail at the top of the structure uh, where we're coming up at the roof where the buttresses are sort of coming in on either side of the building frame column with collectors running on either side to develop the load and pull it back into the, uh, into the new buttresses. So a little bit on those collectors and again uh, Brett will be talking a little bit more about diaphragms and collectors. Uh, in, this, in this instance in the steel frame some of the uh, important parts of this are to provide flexibility in your detailing and one of the ideas here was to um, allow you know your field welding of the plate into the plate that's bolted into the bottom uh, portion of the diaphragm and then you know have the plate be welded in here so that allows some flexibility left and right also using fairly small pieces that can be moved into the building without creating too much problem that was why we sort of went with uh, small channels or, or actually their splits of HSS sections that then were bolted in place into the um, into the plate that then carry the load up to the top and then into the uh, into the diaphragm or out of the diaphragm depending on your, pos your positioning there. Uh, again allowing flexibility here at the connection between the, the this vertical plate and the uh, bolted connection was important to uh, to make sure we can deliver the forces into um, into the buttresses outside the building. Uh, this is a, a shot looking up at the, at the uh, completed connection detail. Another example here is adding steel plate shear walls into uh, a building. This was actually an operating hospital um, that we added some steel plates into uh, uh, add strength and stiffness to the building. You can see the configuration of those plates around the perimeter of the building. In most cases, although, uh, and that allowed us to do a lot of the work from the outside by pulling panels off the side of the building, working from the outside to catch these exterior locations. There were a couple that couldn't be on the exterior, and in those cases we had a lot of issues to deal with, a lot of additional issues to deal with as far as smoke control, um, infection control, those sorts of things since it was an operating hospital at the time and then all the interferences and things that you have to deal with when you're in, in, a, in a building like that. Um, so again, trying to get those steel plates in and coming up with details that will allow flexibility um, and some movement up and down uh, because we also know that the beam is going to have some deflection as it goes uh, across from, as it spans, so it's not, it's not like you can, you can butt something up like this, so you need to use some overlapping type of details. Uh, details for removing the slabs, etc., and then getting those back in place as you put the steel uh, plate in. And then how do you deal with corners? Um, because you're going to have some slots and things to, to open up and get the plate in place. And in this case, I, I believe Oshpod wanted to uh, kind of close those corner openings up, and that's why we went with that sort of detail. Another example here of a, uh, a building, again, that um, where existing it was an existing brace frame, fairly uh, new building built in the 80s with uh, older uh, type of construction where we had these non-ductile bracing, uh, non-ductile braces, uh, high B over T ratios on the HSS plates. And in this case, what we found was that um, we, the, the, the connections and the columns had plenty of strength because the braces were fairly large um, for you know, the compression capacity and tensile capacity. But uh, the braces themselves were fairly, uh, were, were not very ductile. So we were able to use the existing columns and a lot of the gusset plates uh, as they were. Uh, and basically what the, the idea was to swap out the HSS braces with uh, buckling strain braces. And in this case, the buckling strain braces were actually somewhat um, not, or even about the same strength or even a little bit or weaker, if you will, than the original HSS braces. So we were able to use a lot of the gusset plates, and in this case, you can see we tried to, uh, to do a lot of the detailing so that the bolted connection from the, the BRB into the, into the connection plates uh, was outboard of the existing gusset plates that we were able to leave in place. So we were doing fillet welds and then connecting the BRBs, and at that point, a lot of work was done on this, again, to make sure that you could get the BRBs into place and to do all the bolting, et cetera. A lot of time, the, in this case, um, a lot of those came in from the exterior of the building by popping windows out to get the BRBs in place, not having to bring them up through the, the freight elevator. Uh, 
So again, just a couple of shots of how that was done. Um, this is one looking at the column uh, here and the gusset plate, uh, and it was bolted into the, the face of the column. So going again through and checking all the details of the existing gusset plate connection capacity, as well as uh, what we needed to do to transfer all those forces for the new VRBs. Then the last detail, or the last uh, uh, project I'm going to talk about is a, a moment frame uh, building that was upgraded recently in downtown Oakland. Uh, you can see the graphic on the lower right. Um, primarily a perimeter frame, moment frame. This building was uh, built in the early 90s, so between the 89 earthquake in the Bay Area here and the 94 earthquake. Very large sizes in this building, much larger than any that had been uh, tested. The bottom four floors are or parking, and then uh, nine or ten floors of office space above. Um, the detail, the uh, actual retrofit scheme that we ended up coming up with on this building was a combination of um, strengthening connections and uh, making connections more ductile. Uh, we also, and Bill, Bill mentioned, in some cases it's better to not raise the bridge but lower the water. So uh, in this case, we actually changed out some existing moment connections on these short bays, end bays, where when you go through and do your analysis, it indicates that these are the first connections to, to, that will fracture in the event, and we found that in the analyses that we did. We actually cut these loose and made them shear connections, and, and no longer were moment connections in, in the system. We didn't need them for strength after we had uh, done all the other uh, moment frame strengthening connections. Uh, we also added damping. Uh, to the building, and those are you can see those in the diagonals here, uh, up the height of the building to reduce the drift. So, in combination with the damping, reducing the drifts, and the uh, kind of a new system, new set of, uh, of ductile moment connections, we uh, and removal of some of these other connections, we were able to leave some of the existing uh, more non-ductile moment connections in place, uh, and we're able to convince ourselves that even if we fractured a few of those connections, that uh, we would still have a good system. We also looked at because um, of the size of these of the of the moment frames in this building uh, being much larger than anything that had been tested before. We went through and actually did a connection test program. On the next slide, I'll show you the four tests that were approaches that we looked at. Um, and when we did that, because we knew that the it, we were up against the perimeter of this building. Um, the, all of the welding that was done for the retrofit was done with a simulation for the curtain wall of the building here uh, was at the same distance. This, we made them build a plywood wall here that was the same distance from the center line of the beam as the curtain wall was in the real building. So we, we forced the welder to kind of you know, try and work his way around so that we could convince ourselves that they could make all the welds that were on our details. Uh, we actually ended up looking at uh, three different details. Um, the first one was based on the um, AISC design guide um, using the lower haunch. The idea here not to disturb the top flange of the, uh, the top flange weld or the, the concrete slab. Uh, the second one we looked at was a double haunch because we actually ended up getting a fracture in this first test. Um, so we had to go to a more expensive detail with a double haunch. Uh, which ended up being the detail that we finally used. Um, the other one was another one that had been tested at Lehigh on smaller shapes for a, a bolted bracket detail. And uh, so that was the third test we did. And here this simulates the, or the, the testing that was done at UC San Diego. Uh, the, fourth the fourth test that we did was a double haunch on one side of the connection and on the other side simulating the gusset plates that were going to be placed for where a damper bay to verify to ourselves that we would be able to protect the existing welds uh, with the, the, the gusset plates and, and uh, connecting plates that were needed for the damper bay connection. So with that, I think I'll wrap up and I'll take any questions you might have. Yes? Sure, sure, it's a good question. Um, so the, I, the question is, in many of the cases, the recommendations are to remove the weld, the full pen weld between the beam flange and the column flange, but a lot of times not 
removing the weld on the other side at the continuity plate. Um, generally, that, that's true. Um, it's, it, uh, there are cases where you probably sh you definitely need to look at it to see what the, you think the stress levels are. Um, the way that the, the connection works, though, a lot of times the continuity plate demands are going to be less because there is a funneling of the force into the in, from the beam flange into the, the web of the connection because that's a stiffer plate. Um, so generally, we haven't seen a lot of problems with the continuity plate welds, although it's certainly something that you should be looking at. Other questions? I have one sure. Uh, I uh, also realized that for the concentric degrees frame, uh, you mentioned that uh, the existing weld may have a lot of toughness and <laughs> reduce the stress. Is there any uh, suggestion for a uh, level of reduction to the wood score that it should be based on the engineering judgment? Yeah, there's really, uh, it's, it's a good question. So the, the question again is if. Uh, in a brace frame connection, if we feel like we're getting some high stresses in the, some of the welds, uh, how how low should we should we make them? Um, you know, it's it's a good question. I there's no there's no real test results or anything like that, so it is going to be engineering judgment. Um, on the Caltrans project, just as an example, we tried to to, to limit um, some of the connection or welds on existing welds down to about you know maybe. 75% or 80% of uh, the nominal capacity of the weld in order to try and make sure that we, we you know, kind of keep the general weld stresses down to a reasonable level. But that's, you know, that's just a ballpark engineering num number. There's no real uh, guidance anywhere out there on that. Okay. okay, with that, thank you for your attention. <laughs>